Um, before we get deep into tonight's event, I do want to attend to some general structure. So I want to thank Hafiza and Ricky for reading. I want to thank Jesenia Montilla for joining us as an introducer. Uh, and I want to thank all of you tuning in as well. I also want to extend my gratitude to everyone at the Poetry Project who is making sure this event runs as smoothly and thoughtfully as possible and hopefully without any malicious intrusion. So thank you to James Berrickman who was playing Carol King for us and to Corey Hutchinson and Roberto Montez. Uh, Corey is going to drop a link for Zoom FAQs into the chat. We'll keep this public chat open in case anyone wants to express accolades or admiration or just to say hello. Your microphones are switched off um, and you are welcome to keep your video camera either on or off. Please just note that this event is being recorded. So if your camera is on, your face may be visible at some point in the archived video of this event. In the upper left corner of the Zoom screen, I also want to note that there's a link for a live transcription through Otter AI in case anyone may appreciate having access to that feature. We're doing our best to maintain safer space within this digital perimeter. And I'll ask Corey now to share with everyone our statement of safer space. If you do receive any unwanted private communications in the course of this event, please just chat any of the Poetry Project staff who are identified with the appellation staff and we'll get that taken care of right away. If we were gathering tonight, as we have for 50 years in shared place as well as time, we would be in the parish hall of St. Mark's Church. We are committed to continuously and critically engaging the history and future of our presence in this particular space. And as part of that, we would like to acknowledge that our venue as well as the place I am speaking from tonight is built upon unceded indigenous lands specifically the territory of the Lenni Lenape people. We recognize the continual displacement and violence perpetrated against indigenous people and people of color by the US and are aware that these kinds of acknowledgements can be misused as stand-ins for actual decolonization work, which is something for us to keep in mind as we go forward in our ongoing commitment to accountability, reparation and equity. We invite you to join us in this work from all of the different places where you are and are sharing another resource in the chat, a map through nativeland.ca, not as an endorsement of this resource's completeness, but as a starting place for those we hope might feel encouraged to consider in new ways the histories of the places where we are. We usually set up the chairs together and put them away together in the parish hall at St. Mark's. And I find that even as we gather in these more remote grids, our community is still finding ways to make and hold special listening space together. So thank you for being with us and for figuring it out with us through this year. We've made all of these online programs free and we've also continued to pay poets and artists for their readings, performances, teaching, and writing. So if you feel moved to support this work, um, Corey is placing a link to donate in the chat. Uh, all right, I'm so excited to get into this reading. I think of both Hafiza and Ricky as working poets whose imprints on our daily culture have just been indelible, transformative, equally committed to scrutiny and compassion. And I'm really grateful that we get to experience all of this in the space of their poems tonight. So I'm going to introduce, I'm gonna turn now to introducing Hafiza Jeter who will read first. And then after Hafiza, I'm very grateful and honored that the truly brilliant and magnificent Jesenia Montilla will be introducing Ricardo Alberto Maldonado. Born in Zaria, Nigeria, Hafiza Jeter is a Nigerian American poet, writer, and editor. She received her BA in English and Economics from Clemson University and an MFA in Poetry from Columbia College, Chicago. Hafiza's poetry and prose have appeared in The New Yorker, Tin House, Boston Review, Long Reads, and McSweeney's Indelible in the Hippocampus, among others. 
formerly an editor for Little A and Topple Books from Amazon Publishing and newly an agent with Janklo and Nesbitt. Hafiza serves on the planning committee for the Brooklyn Book Festival and lives in Brooklyn, New York, where she's working on a novel about coming to America and a full length nonfiction project about the intersection of anti-Blackness, climate change, language, borders, and the aftermath of American slavery in daily life. Hafiz's debut poetry collection, Un-American, is now available from Wesleyan University Press, and I believe Corey's placing a link for that into the chat. Um, I think Hafiz's vision, dedication, and conviction to building more critically considered culture is so abundantly clear throughout all of her work. Her essays, her clarifying presence as a public thinker, and of course, in her poems as well. I trust and follow and learn from her infrastructural and poetic sensibilities, which strike me as mutually formative, her intuitive perception of elements within a spectrum of culturally entrenched habits, patterns, conventions, and where our pressure and questioning is necessitated whether she is commenting on issues of representation and appropriation or the working conditions of our cultural apparatuses or the narrativization of violence in our media, I always turn to Hafiza to notice and name some particular crucible in the conversation which entirely recasts our collective attention. I'm delighted, honored, and profoundly grateful that we now have this remarkable and important book of poems, Un-American, and in this work, I notice a very analogous manner of associative rigor and originality. Hafiza renders, escalates, and deepens images which spiral and radiate from networks of both tenderness and violence. Even her treatment of etymology and grammar bring awareness to me of how our language is both constitutive and reflective of particularly American violence the continued legacies of slavery and our contemporary police state especially. I think what most deeply moves me about this work now that I'm experiencing these poems as a collected sequence is ultimately the sense of kinship running throughout. The engagements with family life, citizenship, queer love, police brutality are all inextricable from one another, spun with the poet's self-same intelligence and love into her particular sense for relation and interconnection. It is a great pleasure and honor to welcome Hafiza Jeter to the Poetry Project. Thank you so much, Kyle. I always forget that the Poetry Project does those intros that make you blush, you know? <laughs> Um, all right, so thank you all for joining us tonight. I'm super excited to read with Ricky, one of my very good friends, um, and his book is amazing, so everyone should buy it. Uh, so I'll read a few poems from uh, my debut collection, on American. The Pledge. With dirt under her fingernails, our mother held our father's hands. The years marked, hoping one of his paintings would sell. The two of them always in search of auspices, their daughters, their last blood, my sister and I, we were jackknives, a long division, splitting them continents wide, seeds blown and planted, Zarya to Boston, black fruit of Akron winters, Africans hyphenated, down to a promise, cultivated inside the sunlit chains of our father's south. While our mother resurrected in the dark, her prayers are half grief, the spell of protection. She told us what he would not give us, we were forbidden to name. But Allah, like color staining a porcelain sink, I've lain with woman, our mother lost to myth. I'm a test of how far a daughter's memory can go. Our father, a wilted shoot of wheat, wavering against the wind, never expected to age alone in his birth country. Our bondage stretches our ghosts in all direction, trying to outpick the rot America has grown in our throats. <clears throat> So 
Sala. Before Fajr, my sister digs her toes in the lake where blue throated robins have continued to gather. Today is one place to bury a child in what you say after. Or else today is just domestic work, how her bare knee touched mine, the fern finding its way back to life. Today is not a crown, it is the forceps, the sunken flower of my sister's waist. Today, it only took a minute to discover who among us was cruel. We know better than to have daughters now. Today is the scar I put on her thigh, how we've become heirs to each other's hungers. Kiss her and the throne sits empty. Today, my sister is a door put on backwards, but maybe snow finds the cypress or at best the blue robins return. Or maybe today is just another day between the small humiliations. So many times I have pulled my sister's bones apart, took the femur from the tibia. I buried my sister in the backyard. Can't tell you how long I have knelt to this regret. Today, my sister's teeth are slats on the broken bridge between us. We bear our elbows one sleeve at a time while doing dishes, the bed sheets hung to dry, her husband's stain growing darker and darker. How to bring your children to America. The mothers became targets, hanging on clotheslines, bibs of the barely fed children, countries born split in two, firstborns whose first steps aborted their sisters, brothers, the fresh bread of their love language, children, the English tearing sphinxers in two. The mothers came by boat with wings, forgetting their own mother's uteruses, singing praises to Allah. They came over and over again, until it could not matter that so and so had died. We were the nicknames escaping their bellies, the translation between stay and never arrived. Husbands, uncles, we were wives, illnesses, pawpaw seeds, only things that could save them, sickle cells that knew better than to touch. Visible only in their dialect, they sent for cousins, wired money, forgave ancestors we couldn't trust. They stopped speaking to us in our birth language until we became new dictionaries, became the consonants of the constitution they studied, our first words forgotten artifacts in our home countries. They were the ones whose fathers had died in the milt of language without daughters. In America, we were memories without accents or consensus, lambs that couldn't be traded for milk, meal, or honey. The fact of our bodies in America, their new Quran, and oh, how they moaned, how they starved, sucking their teeth between King's English, yelling for us to stop playing immigrant and go get naturalized. Testimony for Sandra Bland. After the miscarriage, she moved to Waller County, wearing the ghost of motherhood and wanting to make old wounds foreign. In my bedroom, I read aloud the list of her contusions, watched an officer drag her from her car over and over again, as if the humiliations would never be done. There were typos in her autopsy report. The words, no signs of struggle. I thought her body is my body, is a church set fire, is a toil that makes the land, a jail cell, light as a paper bag. The sound my father makes when after so many years, he says my mother's name. 28, they split her open where slaves grew cotton at the banks of the Brazos and students at Prairie View a and can barely vote and laid her bare, a coroner's wishbone carved in her chest. 
In Waller County, they still segregate their cemeteries, name some murders, suicide. They fire their police chief, vote him sheriff. Alabama parable. My father leans down the barrel of a shotgun house and looks in both directions. At one end, my great grandfather is leaking like smoke from my aunt's room, where in her body, he has left the smell of fire. At the other end, my grandmother, Gussie May, a bull reluctantly bound to her matador. It is barely a secret that this man is the one thing all the women in my family have in common. My father calls it a night so dark, the dark could have been broken. Teaches me the hardest thing is to be loved by a woman you can't protect. My father looks down the barrel of a shotgun house, sees in my grandmother, hurt like prayer, is a kneeling position. Sees that fearing the wrath of God can make you name any angry man king. He still hesitates during a storm because once upon a time, thunder meant the Lord was working, warns his girls to recognize the certain mold that marks men willing to pay for moonshine, but never rent, says to go for the knees, throat, eyes. He moves like his whole life depends on superstition, sleeps like he's listening for the creaking door, the smoke signals, the witnesses to my aunt's fires. 72 and tired of keeping secrets. Every Christmas, my father gifts me another each an heirloom wrapped tightly in his mouth. Lesson one, there's no God in Alabama. Lesson two, where the road forks between faith and survival. Lesson three, no, my grandmother did the best she could. The kill shot to leave a wounded thing with its heart still beating. Testimony for Eric Garner. Daylight and they dug their fingers into my rectum. Was it intimacy? Was it search? Was it seizure? Bystander footage, marker 433. I become a broken bridge, a wound beneath the belly of a city wolf. Judge, they censor the air and I see my children's faces. This love is blue collar work this exile heritage. I don't regret the kings and queens I've made, though police keep fucking up, keep kicking down the door inside me, master's tools steady, trying to burn our cribs down. My children search mirrors for suspicious activity. Marker 440, the hourglass imitates me. Judge the wolves, they multiply. So intimate come marker 503, their skin takes custody, my breath away. My brother-in-law recites the talk beer. In the revolving door of my sister's apartment, my brother-in-law kneels east, palms the Quran, searching for Mecca. Feet washed, he crosses arms over chest, drowning the days as heavy stones in supplication. My sister, confusing devotion with taking him back, bows by his side. It is a sight that makes my knees buckle, so beautiful and familiar to the days I spent prostrate, mimicking the ricotte of our mother's morning prayers, the beads of her misbaha squeezed tightly between my fingers as I sung the 99 names of Allah. The first time my brother-in-law leaves, his shadow in the bedsheets is a braille my sister deciphers her swollen belly across. The second time she comes to sleep at my house, their new son at her nipple like a hooked fish. It is winter in Chicago, my brother-in-law, having shattered every syllable between them, turned silence into metaphor. 
my sister prays towards the God of our mother and our memories, a God I hope would rather throw away a miracle than bend an ear towards the wishes of a father who has weaponized leaving. My sister looks out into her life cooled by the breeze of a door slamming, a man who only looks back when returning. My brother-in-law is home again. I cradle their son in my arms so they can pray. Enough history between us that my nephew comes quickly, reaches towards my chest as if searching for my sister's residue, his eyes so new, they are my prayer. With my nephew in my arms, the only thing between Allah and me are two cans and a string. My brother-in-law's need a valley, my sister's a mirror. With his eyes wide open, my brother-in-law raises both hands and recites the takbir, the storm in him quelling to a melody. And already I know the next time he leaves, my sister will invite him back into her body, her temperature just beginning to drop after carrying the weight of two heartbeats. Testimony for Michael Brown. For hours I lay there, sun at my back, my blood running a country mile between the pavement and the crown of my head. Officer, no ambulance ever came. It took a long time to cover my body. There are politics to death and here politics performs its own autopsies. My aunties say things like, boy big, black as you. Then the prosecution rests. My neighbors never do. They lose sleep as the National Guard parades down Canfield. I heard my blood was barely dry. I heard there were soldiers beating their shields like war cries. My boys holding hands through their tear gas. I heard my mother wandered the streets, her body trembling between a prayer and a fist. I heard a rumor about riots got started. Officer, I heard that after so much blood, the ground develops a taste for it. Testimony for Tamir Rice. Mr. President, after they shot me, they tackled my sister. The sound of her knees hitting the sidewalk made my stomach ache. It was a bad pain, like when you love someone and they lie to you or that time Michaela cried all through science class and wouldn't tell anyone why. This isn't even my first letter to you. In the first one, I told you about my room and my favorite basketball team and asked you to come visit me in Cleveland or send your autograph. In the second one, I thank you for your responsible citizenship. I hope you're proud of me too. Mom said you made being black beautiful again but that was before someone killed Trayvon. After that came a sadness so big, it made everyone look the same. It was a long time before we could go outside again. Mr. President, it took one whole day for me to die. And even though I'm 12 and not afraid of the dark, I didn't know there could be so much of it or so many other boys here. out of Africa. After so long, our father wants to go home to the continent that named my mother. As soon as next July, my sister says over Skype, while, while outside my window, New York rain fails to snuff summer's fires. The older she gets, the more I see how her six years in Nigeria rival my three how the memory of the land whisks from the switch of her wrists, how African she must seem, a Muslim raising two black boys in Beijing, locals crouching to take my nephew's photos on daily outings, her youngest three screaming no, his skin so black it is bright. 
on the screen, the oldest eight fills his mouth with all the Mandarin and Arabic his smile can muster. Proudly, he shows me all he has of his stepfathers, Jola and Wolof. Something in my sister knows it is easier in China than America to give her children uncolonized language, easier to raise black boys to be men who never forget duty or home. Months and months before her stroke, our mother began looking like a woman who would never see hers again. She read Candide, gave cousins uncharacteristically tearful goodbyes, and slept into the evenings when her legs would ache. In, the new, in a new journal, she wrote all of her names, Hawa, Tini, Adamu, Jeter, then nothing else. When I shudder at the questions I cannot answer in our birth country, my sister insists Mom would have been this way too. It's cultural, she will say, needing even cruel things to be simple. A laugh in her voice I can't place. When my sister says Nigeria, her voice sounds starved to see our father again. What with tickets so cheap, she suggests we return with him to the country that can call his daughter's names by blood. The land where our family will ask why I haven't a husband, cousins, aunties, sending theirs out into the rainy season to fetch me one. The Widower. Five winters in a row, my father knuckles the trunk of his backyard pine like he's testing a watermelon. He scolds smooth patches where bark won't grow breaks branches to find them hollow. He inhales deeply and the pine tree has lost even its scent. My father, the backyard forest king, the humble king, the dragging his scepter through the darkness king, king who won't lay his tenderness down, trembles into the black, unable to stop his kingdom from dying. Three hundred girls. Nineteen ninety. The heat in Nigeria doesn't care that it's rainy season, that the mangoes rot, of the sound of milk cans buckling in the pantry. The lights have been gone four days. The houseboy returns with gasoline, bread, warm bottles of orange soda. It is an hour outside evening. My sister waves her passport like a fan. Auntie Myro and Auntie Asabe unwrap their headscarves, their hair springing like perennials. Inside each sigh, they leave a name, their bodies smelling of a whole country. 2004. When Auntie Asabe picks us up from the airport, she drives right up the landing strip. Kano smells of ripened avocados and men with semi-automatics. Laughing, she tells us the price of petrol has been rising for weeks. Soon, the whole country will strike. At the compound, she waves to armed guards, keeping out thieves and militia. We eat fufu, ifo, and a goosey soup. My sister, bowl after bowl of jello fries. Like a woman no longer living outside the language of her happiness, my mother smiles with her teeth her hands to bright shadows. Auntie Myro shakes her head and says their youngest brother has disappeared, plucking bees from his mind. How their eldest comes to money. The generator sputters in the distance. No second wives cloud their conversation. 2014. Switching between Hausa and English, the ghost of my mother says, ah, ah, how do you steal? 300 girls. She begins listing names, rejoice, Jumai, blessing, Asabe like your auntie, she says, Hanatu like your yaya, 14 hawas like me, she says, as though I've forgotten. Mothers in Chabuk are so weeping on the floors of classrooms burned into burial grounds. 
my Nigerian passport expires. The news calculates their dowry at 12 American dollars. Reports girls perish of snake bites, malaria, the rest by marriage. I'm just gonna read two more, thank you. Naming my mother. In hallways, in the kitchen, kai from your throat like spicy suya. It meant upset, astonished, your nerves so tired. It was Africa happening inside you. In other languages, Kai translates to keeper of the keys, to love. Only Hausa saturates the word with phonemes, meaning you or self, carry or reach. It means to be equal to, to be enough. So much writing on the indentation of a voice. Mother, Kai, taught me to listen, to press my ear to the eye of every stranger who butchered your name, which in our first language still means Adam's Black Eve. You wanted daughters instead of sons, which you named your firstborn meant beautiful. I was protector. So when you kneeled east in America, clean for Isha, I wished you a Nancy, a Beth, something so white it appeared just washed. Hawa, uh, all these years and there's still the murmur of you. Kai, a rattle in my throat. Our names to familiar sounds turn strange, tight ropes swaying in a colonial country. Haj. All these years she's been gone, Allah still picks her bones clean. His mouth still drips with her marrow. How an American, a stranger on familiar land, I touch my head east. I say, Allahu Akbar, my voice foreign even unto him, who appears, the moon, as though appearing were a simple thing. Thank you. With silent clapter, I love it. I see that that was really beautiful. Um, wow. Thank you. Um, all of you, it is such an honor to be here tonight to introduce my friend. And honestly, one of the most transcendent poets writing today, Ricardo Alberto Maldonado. Born in Puerto Rico, poet, translator, Canta Mundo and Naifa Fellow. Managing Director of the Poetry Center at the 92nd Street Y. There's really nothing in this world I feel Ricardo cannot do. I met Ricardo through Canto Mundo and he has been a constant gift in my life, a person of strong convictions, calm tenderness, and a giving spirit. Every interaction I have with him shifts my world as does his poetry. So of course, when asked to introduce Ricardo, I was terrified, <laughs> but I still said yes, because I couldn't imagine a greater honor than to be able to talk to someone you love about their work and tell them in front of others how they have truly spoken, not just words, but ideas and modes of being into your ear through their language and their risk taking on the page. I'm deeply moved to have been asked and deeply grateful to have the opportunity to be here. Um, this year has been a year of great challenges in the midst of a tyrannical presidency or an almost tyrannical presidency. We have also been thrown into a global pandemic and seen vital social unrest. In these precarious times in which this country has made a lot of us feel deeply colonized, in which the money is dwindling and the bars are closed, in which love seems to be how tightly we can hold on to our own body in the dark in which the dead are everywhere, I can't imagine a better collection of poetry than the life assignment to get me through. And look at this. Look at this author bio. I hope you guys can see it. Um, it's beautiful. So I hope all of you go out and buy it. Um, in this collection, Maldonado uses his poetic voice and his prowess towards the lyrical 
to remind each of us of the tremendous unhinged inequity that resides within capitalism, especially when used as a method of self-measurement. Maldonado does not shy away from the power and spell of capital. He also never shies away from Puerto Rico, from his mother tongue, from using language like a house of mirrors in which both English and Spanish exist instinctively as truth tellers and distorted paradigms of one another. Did I mention the book is bilingue, that besides writing the poems in English, he also wrote them in Spanish. The translating of these poems feels so much like a love letter to all of us in the diaspora, living out loud in a burgeoning world. Anthony Burge's rights of translation. Translation is not a matter of words only. It is a matter of making intelligible a whole culture. And this is work that Maldonado does well. The homage that he pays to his Borinquen querido, his Puerto Rico, those that made him, even in their complexities, the inexplicable griefs of Maria and oppression, the language queer, which by this I mean universal, the dreaming of the tender details of what it takes to live a life. It's all here in both languages, a symphony. Como escribe en mi mamá me ama. He starts the poem with this gorgeous gem. I have a moon. I had six mothers in my poverty. This magnanimous line shows the relationship between that of having plenty and that having at all. And this is a central theme to his work and should be a central theme for us all as we move forward and navigate our new world. To us, it's a new world. To Maldonado, a world he somehow envisioned and sought to prepare us for. In one of my favorite poemas, A Bird for Felipe, A Bird for Damian, he begins, a man dies in this world by a fist of trees, more than by our love. And later in the same poem, who am I to be yours in this compulsory century, but a father without possessive? I loved, I loved, I loved presently. Maldonado has given us language as dreamscape, lyric as reasoning, and offers us los detalles some small and filtering, such as the white tennis shorts that I can't get out of my mind in the poem Vita Nova, and some so full of tender melancholy that you almost ache in Espanol, as when he writes, la miel helada, coughed out when it rains. Through his masterful lyricism, Maldonado pushes the boundaries of how we experience colonialism, queerness, displacement, he asks us to answer so many questions for the betterment of our own lives. But the ones that stand out, stand out for me, especially as I move forward in this new way of being is what is debt? And what am I willing to owe in this life? What am I willing to pay? Answering these may help us forge our own path to freedom, monetary maybe. But I wonder every time I come back to the work, what Maldonado is truly trying to tell us, what he's asking us to account for, that goes beyond economy. Um, for now, let's just find solace and beauty in the pages of this collection in his reading tonight. Let us welcome Ricardo Alberto Maldonado. To me, Ricky. Gracias, Yesenia. Thank you, Hafiza, Kyle, Roberto, everyone of the project. I wanted to start by saying that the project I gravitate towards the, the project not only because it is a community, but it is a community that gives me something more, by which I mean corroboration. Um, and um, I feel like as a member of this community, I want to encourage everyone uh, who can give um, to the project to do so later tonight. Um, um, my wish is that 10 years from now, a young poet will find home at the project 20 years from now. Um, uh, so I'm really grateful. Uh, I'm very grateful, I'm very moved right now. Um, I'm gonna start my reading by reading a poem from uh, uh, the anthology Puerto Rico and Mi Corazon, um, of which I, for which I was uh, a co-editor with Raquel Salas Rivera, Karina del Valle Shorsky, and Erica Mena. 
Uh, this is a poem by Nicole Cecilia Delgado, a terrific Puerto Rican poet and literary activist, and it's translated by Karina del Valle Shorsky. With my body, I read the cycles of nature. With my body, I read the cycles of nature. Soon enough, I feel tree-like and grow leaves. My heart palpitates and pumps blood through all these branches. The days accumulate in different ways. Some days, one is simply not ready, ready to die. Somehow I take in my mouth the word offering and then it's the moment I won't wait for, nothing from nobody. So um, as Yesenia mentioned, this is a uh, bilingual anthology, not, uh, sorry, a bilingual collection. Not all the poems were translated um, uh, into English, but um, I will be reading in Spanish. I'm not sure of those of you who are reading through um, the transcription service, um, I'm not sure how reliable it is, but if it's not, then reach out to me and I will get the poems to you. Uh, this is a poem uh, that came to me uh, the night before my mother's quadruple bypass surgery in which I found her um, taking out from her purse a collection of um, prayer cards. And I remember feeling extreme tenderness towards her um, and her belief in a God I don't believe in. Um, but if that is a version of God, then that's a, an honorable and kind version of a God that I could uh, get behind. In defense of the life assignment. I started at the surface feeling about my face, the law jawbone my mother had given me as weapon against austerity. Two decades before my father had died, I was desperate under summer's isosceles, a fragile machine descended with a yellowing haste on the city. Whom had I been then but the sediment inside that thing I named Ricardo Alberto. Blessed is he, blessed in the reddening of medical pins, blessed under fluorine yokes, I venerated my mother at Centro Medico, her prayer cards at midnight, the saffron of her blood tearing as it coursed a thick mass on concrete inside coral. Mother, today it snows in another city besieged by comet tails. You breathe that day the sharp instrument of men on your heart waited, they waited. I remember the wings of your lungs. It was midnight when I went in search of angels in the shoes of the sick near the gates of heaven. On the seventh day, we all take repose in the kingdom of the sick. Blessed are they, blessed the cold comfort of a wind rushing over teeth. Blessed the long corridors of heaven. Blessed the gelatin in refrigerators, the instant coffee. Blessed our sentence of silver, of flowers. Blessed, be blessed. This poem, this poem takes its title from um, uh, a poem by uh, Pablo Neruda and it was written in response to a writing exercise by Daniel Borsutsky. Um, he asked us to find the poem or he gave us a list of poems and he asked us to ask questions of that poem. Um, Neruda's poem is, I explain a few things. Uh, my title is, A Few Things Are Explained to Me. It was five o'clock when paper handkerchiefs descended over the earth's ocean surge. One ocean varnished by oil in the morning, fish under the surge's blades. My country, you whimpered under fog. I awoke to the tender sound of seashells on the radio. I knelt by myself and listened. Your flat skeleton, la large skeleton would group at the back. Come, you murmured over canned goods. Come, I will tell you everything. Clay seeps onto roots, roots drawn by salt, roots crowned by trees. The cords unravel from the flesh of trees unravel by storm shutters. Come, see the roads brim with red poppy, roads tracked by green serpents. A la vibora, vibora de la mar, de la mar. 
I tender nine eggs before the ignorant lion of exile who nodded. At five in the morning, everything seemed to be made of lime, one torso shrouded by magnolia, one torso under vulgar peel of gray morgues and the fish. Um, that five in the morning was when I woke up on the day Maria made landfall in Puerto Rico. And um, by that time, all the, uh, so most of the island has lo had lost its powers, including radio signals. So I could not listen to the radio. Um, now uh, the following is a poem about Washington Heights and my former roommates and my former home. I lived there for seven years. Self-criticism as an act of love. The love seed my familiar had me half numb. I made the sign at the rim of the clearing outside on the fire escape where I would toss Marlboros out in the dream of discipline. Milk in a bottle, heating in the sun, I prayed likely infected by the warm climate and the walk up and the home inside it where I would read a book and the pines keeping roots nocturnal. I would ride with my spectacles, lightheaded and pre-sexual. My pallid face made me think of the fabric on my chest, pronouncing my fear beyond words, made mad to be in my flesh for one last minute. One thing I made by being there, waiting to find my home by the curve and the highway and the bridge, day and night in Manhattan, the borough and the wind. Mi mama me ama. I have a moon. I have six mothers in my poverty. Is this all I have for myself? I was born like everyone else in a house with one door. I have memories to revise. No doubt you'll find my expiration date. Mi mama me ama. I laid waste to my health in the walls of her heart while regretting this analogy for the labor of the body. I had a house with three windows. I remembered her alone with her memories of youth. The deep hearted course of one rough word turned judgment in my blood. It was mother. As for her, this is the truth. When she cries for her mother, I dismantle all walls to extract her with one word. That word was mother. I learned her sacrifice and grace. I had one moon. Mother, teach me when to seek out. I'll note the expiration date. That's how I talked while my mother with fruit fed me. I give you my heart, os doy mi corazón. I find myself on my feet with 15 leaves. Everything carries its own light on the walls. I woke up to slaughter, my heart opening to cemeteries of moon, the parasites, the drizzle, the mud crowning the undergrowth with immense sadness. I knew death when I dressed in my uniform. I found the index of my solitude, my country in its legal jargon, its piety, its fiction. Yes, it loves me really. I give my blood as the blood of all fish. Encuentro de pie con quince hojas, brilla todos los muros. Desperté en su sacrificio, mi corazón se abría entre cementerios de luna, los parásitos, la llovina, el lodo coronando la maleza con mustios grandes. Supe de mi muerte el vestir de uniforme. Encontré el índice de soledad, mi país, en su jerga legal, su piedad, su ficción, si me quiere de verdad. Doy mi sangre como la sangre de todos los peces. A few poems uh, to read. I think I'm going to read three more. Uh, this is a poem where I've been, I've been thinking how the chemistry of the world allows for something like faith in benevolence and charity, um, but also allows something deeply destructive uh, within and beyond our borders. Um, so this is a poem uh, that tries to bring all of that together. Uh, the commodities market. Where one finds poetry, one finds the Lord, God of epic, the golden instrument on our Lord's plum, God the body, pelt of our Lord, 
red cap for a red god, tree of the heavens. Remember Jose Daniel, the God we engraved on our desks, Christ of our Lord, Christ of our children, Lord's denominator in Lord's arithmetic, a pair of children's scissors, God at our borders, the salt of our Lord, God's ocean of cotton, of sugar, a nickname for God, the Lord, elephant, Lord, mule, Lord's acres, hospital, Lord, Texas for God, Alabama, God's sea of blue tarps, our Lord's November and August for our God, roses of God for the roses, clouds for the Lord, will the gods disappear, their arms full of roses, the wall of our Lord, our Lord in God's roses, Lord's wound of flowering red, one heaven of fog clouding faces for a heaven of roses, a heaven for God, our Lord in the darkness of numbers, Lord's ice box, Lord's cages for the children of God, an armful of roses for roses of God, God's labor, God's Wednesdays as labor and the labor of God. Um, Lesionado. Maybe this will be a poem about power, reading, rereading whatever shape the intelligence takes. Somewhere, somehow, the men, the state, somewhere seems to destroy, only we should be beautiful and practical. Finding beauty will stand everywhere among two Victorias, my brothers and I among them, home for its noun, home for its soil, one, two, three, four, and I among them. Maybe this is a poem about power. Maybe this is a poem about love. Tal vez este sea un poema sobre el poder, leyendo, releyendo cualquier forma que la inteligencia pudiese tomar. De algún modo, donde van hombres el Estado, de algún modo les parece destruir. Solo debemos ser hermosos y prácticos, encontrando que durará la belleza en todas partes. Entre dos victorias, mis hermanos y yo, ese hogar como sustantivo, ese hogar en su barro, uno, dos, tres, cuatro, y yo entre ellos. Tal vez este sea un poema sobre el amor. Tal vez este sea un poema sobre el poder. And then, um, to close and on, on collect a poem, um, hopefully from my uh, upcoming collection. Um, and by upcoming, I mean, um, who knows when. Um, uh, this poem uh, only has, has uh, one lie. Um, have to use six words today. Eight palabras tuve que usar hoy. If you, America, owned, for example, your Brooklyn of absolute gift, reached safely that charter of rights for the Republic, its austerity measures, that charter of oversight, management, and economic stability, would suggest we were subject to your dissertation as we were its readers. America, are you the president? Sea train in its abstract melancholy. And forgive us if we lean toward the mystery inside. For example, our brother called me Capricorn in Bushwick, thick in Park Slope, suggested translation of my name. I was in New Jersey. If I were to find one thing inside six walls, it would be Marcus, my boss's cat the deadbolt making my home out of Thanatos so I may hope to be its human reader. Two weeks after Maria, I send a text despite keeping no receipt for $3. Oh, America, lay your immense wake over me. I alone in my room for us. I sing, I, America, whom you are holding now in hand. Look, forgive me everything gotten up in my used sheets America at six in the morning with a poem in mind. Y fueses América poseyendo, por ejemplo, el Brooklyn de regalo absoluto, aún alcanzaría seguramente esa carta de derechos de la República, o sea, su ley de control fiscal, ley de supervisión, gestión y estabilidad económica, sugiere de nosotros, tal y como éramos de sus lectores, América, eres el presidente, Pensé en su melancolía abstracta. Entonces, perdona, nos inclinamos por misterio dentro. Por ejemplo, si nuestro prójimo me llamara Capricornio en Bushwick, 
Peak and Park Slope. Sugirió traducción de mi nombre, pero eso fue en Nueva Jersey. Y debe haber algo entre estas seis paredes. Debe ser Marcus, el gato del jefe. Una cerradura haciendo hogar de su tánatos, que somos más que su lector humano. Dos semanas luego de María, mandó un texto a pesar de no tener recibo por tres dólares. Oh, América, abre tu estela inmensa sobre mí. Yo solo en este cuarto por nosotros canto yo, América, ya que me estás sosteniendo ahora en mano. Libro, perdóname todo. Me he levantado entre sábanas usadas, América, a las seis con un poema en mente. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ricky. Um, wow, wow. You're just, your whole spirit and presence and poetry are totally alive with one another. It's just really, really beautiful and special to get to experience your poems in this way. Um, and I feel so grateful that as this year comes to its end, um, we get to be with these two readings together. They were just really connective and incredible and brilliant. And thank you so much, Jesenia, for such an incredible introduction for Ricky. Um, and thank you, everyone. I, I really feel we make this space together and that includes um, through our listening. And I, I just, I feel incredibly <clears throat> appreciative for, uh, all of the heart and attention that everyone brings to this space. Um, Corey has put into the chat the links for purchasing Ricky's and Hafiza's books. If you don't have them, I wholly encourage you to, to go out and get these books or to get them and share them with your loved ones. Um, there's a link as well to donate to the project. Um, Our next and last reading is this Wednesday with Matilda Bernstein Sycamore, who I think is in the audience tonight, uh, who will be in conversation with Maggie Nelson about uh, the freezer door. I'm super excited for that event. I'm really grateful to Hafiza and Ricky and Jesenia and to all of you too. Um, we're gonna open up the Zoom for about 10 more minutes, so until 10 after nine or so. Um, folks are welcome to turn on their microphones now. It's not a Q&A, but if you do want to share appreciations or hellos, uh, you're welcome to do that. Hi, everyone. Also, Kyle, the idea of just being sit, sit, sitting here and being complimented is hell. <laughs> Yeah, I, I need I need to have a chat with my therapist tomorrow. Yeah, about that. I'd rather have a uh, question that's more of a comment. <laughs> uh, for real, Jasenia, I need that intro to uh, print it and look at it when I feel lost. I'll send it to you, of course. Yes. Of course. Um, I thought both of you were on fire tonight. Um, I've heard both of you read numerous times and I just felt like tonight there was something magical that happened and um, I feel really lucky to have witnessed it. So thank you, thank you. Hafiza, Enrique, and Kyle for always creating this space. I also want to thank everyone who's still in the room and um, It takes a, I mean, it's kind of a gift given, given, given the fact that we're always on Zoom and um, it's, it's uh, really wonderful. It's really affirming. That's it. I don't have to say anything else. <laughs> so how's everyone doing? You're leaving, that's what they're doing. <laughs> well, I think it feels like tonight, maybe the appreciations are primarily our chat appreciations yeah. that are coming in. 
so um so I might propose that we adjourn our night um, and just stay in the glow of the of the chat and the readings. Um, support these poets' work. Um, come back to the poetry project. And thank you and good night, everybody. Thank you. Stay safe, everybody. Stay Wear safe your masks. Stay inside. Stay inside. Wear your masks. <laughs>